Uh, session one is about to begin. Uh, Kate, uh, if, if you're ready, uh, do you have a presentation? Okay, all right, if you want to take the podium, please. So Kate Harridan is a Wiradjuri woman who is a CAPER Visiting Indigenous Fellow and Research Fellow, as well as a member of the Monash University Sustainable Development Institute. She enjoys playing in stormwater channels and playing in creeks and dreams of a concrete free urban street. And buildings that don't decide for us when we want the windows open and closed. <laughs> yeah, I've gone with um, no presentation option today because I've found lately that when I've been using PowerPoints, I become quite undisciplined. <laughs> and it's maybe not the time to be quite undisciplined. So you would have around Naya Naru Nurumbang Ninga Irubandu Niang Wiradjuri Darai Gamwamba Naru Ninglegi and Ninga Nawambinju Baduka Barabu Bandangu Uninga Nurumbangu Galingalingbu Baduka Baramai Berandi Madu Buyala Bu Girbu Baduka Baramai Girban Berandi Nunubu Wiradjuri Bu Nurumbang Gawubu Baduka Baramai Guau Ninga Dalang, you and Kate Baladu, you know, were graduate. So I started by saying hi, asking permission to speak my language on this country, this not being my country. Welcome you all to this presentation. I acknowledge and thank this country and waters, and acknowledge the ancestors, elders, and those who are to come. I also acknowledged all the people from Nunawar, Wiradjuri, and other countries that may be here today, and all you other non Indigenous, foreign non Indigenous people here today. I said my name is Kate and that I am a Wiradjuri woman. The aspect of country that I particularly want to acknowledge today um, are the water holes and stream banks where so many massacres took place. So given the topic of this showcase, histories, legacies and violence, I think it's really important that we acknowledge that Gouda Creek on the water of Greater Moe and Bateman was a site of a massacre, including babies being massacred. I don't think that's well known enough in this city. And so as you drive over Gouda Creek, which is a Wiradjuri and Nunawal word for baby, um, please pay your respects. I think it's important that, well, in fact, I was going to say lest, it's important and relevant that we talk about that today, lest we forget because country never does. And let's also not forget, as Uncle Paul has rightly appropriately pointed out, that sovereignty was never ceded. So invasion and colonisation, colonisation, uh, we all know, are violent acts. Colonisation is the slow violence to invasions, fast violence. This violence is historical, so think of the massacres, but also contemporary, so think of rates of incarceration. Um, they're geographically situated acts, yet have trans-geographical echoes across the temporal space, space. Tactics trialled in the African Empire were well honed by the 1788 landing of colonial tall ships on Gadigal country. But violence, as we all know, is not only physical. Some of the most effective violence is not. I've just spent an hour with a lawyer. The violence of the colonial settler state also has intellectual armory. Indigenous knowledge systems have historically both denigrated and decimated, um, usually but only, only by um, Western knowledge systems, but mostly Western knowledge systems and particularly science. For some Indigenous peoples in the northeast of what is now known as Thailand, their science, which is embedded in this thing called, in English, local wisdom, but in Thai, Pung Ban Yao Tong Tin, um, has had a double, a double whammy of this epistemological violence. Um, traditionally, or historically, it's this Pung Ban Yao Tong Tin was dismissed by the Siamese central mandala, maybe is a better word, power, to help prevent the um, full and official <laughs> as opposed to the unofficial colonisation of Thailand. And then when post uh, the Second World War, Thailand became this nation state. Now those same areas are being recolonised by Siamese priorities rather than, you know, their own priorities. Um, yeah, so this, this knowledge was dismissed to keep the formal colonisation efforts at bay by Europeans. Um, now, since Thailand's become a nation state and decided that there's some value of the Pumbanya Tong Tin, and across the world, there's been more interest in indigenous sciences. But in Thailand, there remains a series of tattered scientific systems from this epistemological legacy of colonial violence. But the same has happened here. 
there is a tattered system, tattered scientific system left on this flat ground land. And as increasing interest in just aspects of indigenous sciences by states, research groups and universities um, and other organisations entrenched in colonial ways of being, this, this is increasingly happening here too. And it's usually accompanied by um, current values and beliefs about the practice of colonial science as opposed to the beliefs and values of indigenous sciences. And I actually see that this becomes, this has the potential to become a new legacy of colonial violence on indigenous knowledges. And that is where you start doing indigenous science as if it is simply a variation of Western science. But there are very two important practices that separate Western and indigenous sciences um, from this shared ideal. So I think there's an old diagram I often put up that's got you know two circles of Venn diagram and the bit in the middle is the bit that I think that most of us as lay people would regard as science. So it's long-term observations, trying to um, come up with reasonable explanations for complex and sometimes not so complex scientific or natural phenomena, placing these things in a pattern over time and space. Um, I think that broadly we agree that that's kind of science. But the practice of science is actually quite different and, and the, like the values and the beliefs that sit around it. The first way in which they're quite, which, which science can be quite differently practiced is this notion of human-centered versus country-centered. So Western science, it's all about the human, the, the focus of the decision-making and all the actions. And, and, and let's be fair, it's not even always about the human. It's often about specific groups of humans. Um, so I think it's partly for this focus with this large agreement that the community agrees that things should be human focused. And so with this, um, as a background, there are very few people with colonized minds who would question or protest the straightening and armoring of some streams or forcing others into cold, dark, underground concrete pipes, not that I'm claustrophobic. Mm -hmm. um, indigenous sciences are country-centered. So decision-making and action is around country what it needs, what it wants, what it can share, what country has to say. So um, there are protests on behalf of rivers by indigenous peoples in Thailand, the Mun River being one of the better known examples, and even on this flat brown continent. So the Marawa, the Fitzroy River up in the Northwest, is a recent addition to a quite long list. Um, these protests are not uncommon. They're just unreported. It's really quite that simple. The second difference in the practice of science between Western, read air quotes every time I say Western, and Indigenous, and that is relationships. So in Western science, often under the guise of this objective, impartial, unbiased, now thankfully debunked idea of Western science, it's actually really quite exploitative and extractive. And relationships is one really key area where Western science goes for exploitation and extraction in a really very profound way. Um, And they always look at relationships as just between humans. But in indigenous sciences, the relationality is between humans and everything else, which for today we'll call country. But basically it's more than human. You know, it's everything that's not human. It's everything that's sentient, it's everything that's not sentient. It's the things that we can see, it's the things that we can't see. That's a relationship. And you are obliged to maintain relationships in a positive and constructive way in indigenous practice. So what happens in indigenous science is that the relationship between the human and everything else is often, in fact, really the central relationship of importance. It might be between human and more than human, but often it's also more than human and other more than human. Basically, we just aren't as important as we think we are and we need to come to grips with that. Relationality doesn't um, encompass just sentient beings and entities. It also encompasses ideas and institutions, again, broadly defined institutions and ideas. Contemporary interest from parties that, let's be fair, the nicest way I can say we're formally antagonistic to Indigenous sciences, um, rushes to really focus on the remnant elements of Indigenous sciences that can be rapidly extracted for someone else's benefit. So this is like data sets or things with medicinal values or their mind. Indigenous sciences are mined for solutions to the, West, to the mess that the West or Western science has created of the natural world. But if you were to practice indigenous sciences like this, to dismiss the values and practices supporting the data sets and scientific practices, is to reduce these sophisticated bodies of scientific knowledges to pieces in the game of Western science. 
Now, what he noted that acts of violence, non-physical and epistemological, are not historical, but continuous and contemporaneous, offering a million little opportunities daily to have mind and country colonised. Being made to check your way of doing science at the entrance of the university's corridor is an act of non-physical violence. To have your ways of science rejected outright, <laughs> no, that's not science, or regarded as a thing as little or no value, and surely if it does exist, is just inferior to real science, I've been told this, real science, is an ecumistological act of colonial violence, and it's offensive, and don't say it. Sorry, I had a bad morning with the lawyer, sorry. Yeah. Um, the aggressive absence of room in the Western Academy for underloaded Indigenous epistemology, epistemology and methodology, let alone the two big hairy ones of uh, axiology and ontology, um, is just another legacy of colonial violence that we have to deal with basically every second of every day. And now, now the Academy is beginning to find some interest in our tattered bodies of knowledge that they tattered um, through the proven failure, by, by, by fiddling at the margins of this well-proven failure of Western science, by play acting a caring for the natural world with bland, filleted versions of indigenous sciences. And while Western science might do a really great line in producing mobile phones really cheap, what they cannot, what it cannot do is care for country on the best of policy-based evidence days, or perhaps I should have said best of evidence-based policy days. Western science is not geared for the natural world. Another legacy of the continual quest to colonise the Indigenous mind is the dearth of Indigenous scholars, academics and field of expertise in the academy. I look across to my pony. Um, given there are other legacies of colonial, uh, of this history of colonial epistemological, that is such a horrendous word, <laughs> violence to examine. Um, well, let's just put aside for the time now if this is actually an intellectual part of the model of the colonial project. I want to move into things that are slightly more, more positive. So, um, Kim, 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 Kimera, I always fall over her name, in that lovely braiding sweet grass. I hope some of you had a chance to go through some of that. Shares um, the seventh fire prophecy of the Anishabi people of North America. For the first two fires, these are the times of the travels of the Anishabi people and the division into three tribes. The time of the third fire, these people come back together to reunite, forming what still exists as a three fire confederacy. And they flourished in this confederacy during a long period where they were relationally accountable to and with the natural world. The arrival of the light-skinned people in ships marked the beginning of fourth fire times. Dun, dun, dun. Sorry, this is, why I, this is why I write down notes. I wouldn't do stuff like that. Um, fifth fire times, see people turned, actually turned from their sacred ways through colonial practices, such as separating families, moving people to reservations and missions, prohibiting language use. And then in, the, in turn, asking them, asking is a very, again, a polite way of saying, making them learn the practices and mores of the fair-skinned people from their ships. The time of the sixth fire is that of people turning away from elders and the knowledge that they hold. But we are in the time of the fifth fire, and this is the time of rebuilding, a time when, and I quote, people would turn back to the elders for teaching. People of the seventh fire do not walk forward, Rather, they are told to turn around and retrace the steps of the ones who brought us here, to gather up all the fragments that they scattered along the trail, to the ones who bend to the task of putting things back together again, to rekindle flames to the sacred fire, to begin the rebirth of a nation. Seventh fire times, living and breathing in them. This fire requires stoking across the generations, and Paul, you, to me, to our children, grandchildren. But it also requires that this labour is shared by the generations. So one example of this quite personal, well, it's a relatively personal example of this transgenerational nature of the seventh fire times is Mama Bar Stan, Uncle Stan Grant. Not Stan Grant, the journalist, he's Stan Grant. Uncle Stan Grant, Uncle Stan is Stan the journalist's father. Uncle Stan the journalist might be his uncle for a while yet, yeah, you know, like Uncle Stan is, but anyway. When Uncle Stan was a young boy, an elder, an uncle yelled at him across the street in town, in Wiradjuri. That elder went to prison for that act. And when they came out, they said to Uncle Stan, they will never speak Wiradjuri in public again. For those who don't know, Uncle Stan has rebuilt, revitalised with Dr John Rudder, 
my language. Well, I can speak to you with those words. We have a dictionary, the most complex and convoluted and confusing grammar book for any language you will ever come across, which is only partly a reflection of the language. But Uncle Stan is a seventh fire man. And what he has done for the young Wiradjuri, Wiradjuri language, I hope to continue to contribute in a small way to doing with uh, Indigenous water science frameworks and methods. And that this, this will be a retracing, a regathering and a rebuilding that will be done following and alongside other deadly Indigenous women such as Virginia Marshall, Anne Paulina, Eleanor Heyman and Marcia Langton. And all but one of them live on this flat brown country. So we've got some great Indigenous women who deal water in this country. So my PhD research, which was nominally why I was invited to speak here today, and I'm going to spend this much talking about, um, represents my initial and quite modest contribution to this retracing, regathering and rebuilding of Indigenous water science knowledge and practices in an effort, a conscious and deliberate effort, to address the legacy of colonial epistemological violence. Noting, be quite clear, that the explicit value-laden use of Indigenous science frameworks in academic settings is an act of epistemological sovereignty. An act that responds to the legacies both described and ignored in this part of, on this side of the podium. Um, that creates space for other indigenous people to do more of this kind of stuff. So for retracing in my PhD, I um, was so lovely to hear Uncle Paul talk today. Yinjimara everywhere. Uh, Yinjimara is my retracing. So Yinjimara is not just a Wiradjuri word, obviously, but I will describe it for the Wiradjuri definition, although Uncle Paul was pretty close. Um, languages are shared. Uh, Wiradjuri version of Yinjimara is um, go slow, be honourable, to show respect, to do, and, and it's a transitive verb, so you are, it's a coming away from you, okay? I can't say you Yinjimara me, I Yinjimara you. Um, and it's, Yinjimara is, okay, the Wiradjuri word for, for what is actually a way of being, for our way of living. It's the way we're expected to behave. Pretty much every Indigenous language that I've come across, and really just literally a handful, um, have some version of this feeling. So I don't know anyone here who does work with Yaru, or might have heard of Leon, they talk about Leon in Yaru. Yep, okay, good to have not. So it's that kind of sense of the way you need to behave as a, as a person in this community. Um, so I'm retracing notions of Yinjimara through using it as my primary research philosophy, like it overarches everything that I do, um, and in the cultural sense, as the full cultural sense. I have an audience challenge, three audience challenges. This is number one. I would like you to please, and those who live, work and um, play on Nunawal country, you've done very well. Because um, I want you to find, learn and understand the word or concept of the mob in whose country you live and work and play that reflects Yinjimara or Lia. Okay, it's just an act of allyship. Start getting you thinking like an indigenous, well, you know, an indigenous way of thinking going on. For regathering, uh, I used centering country as one of my frameworks. So I'm bringing country back to the centre of everything that we think about and everything that we do, both in, obviously in my PhD, it was in my science practices, but also in the way I do me. Um, and centering countries will fundamentally change the way that science is done, the questions that we ask, the answers that we get, and the answers that we can accept. Um, And what, what gathering country is, it's a regathering and an act, it, it's a regathering act in that I'm regathering the priorities of elders and I'm picking up on the fragments of country that remain in Songlines art, ceremony, initiations. There was a suite of expertise, uh, what's the word I want? Like you marked as an expert, there was a suite of activities, knowledge is held in that, all that knowledge has not been destroyed. Some of it remains. Uh, so my audience challenge for a gathering is how can each and every single one of you better centre country in your work? Uh, and my third thing for rebuilding was about relational accountability. Um, relational accountability has been described by mm, a few, quite a few, Indigenous science practitioners and philosophers as the critical Indigenous research method or framework. And relational accountability is both as simple and as difficult as tending to all your relationships in a meaningful, well, 
do our Yinjimara, with Yinjimara, okay? Respectfully, go slowly, with honour, being polite. Um, again, fundamentally changes how you science, whatever, like I talk about science because I'm just finishing a science PhD. This applies, Centenary Country and Yinjimara applies across the board in anything that you do. I don't care if you're fighting fires, writing policies, at home caring for your mother. It's everything. Uh, and, and just really quickly, because I've already been given, a, and I know I'm about this far left, um, ethics, uh, sorry, the relation accountability is an excellent, is an excellent ethical, ethics protocol, uh, better than anything in a university can come up with. Strongly encourage you to read anything written by Barwaka Country et al, and you'll get some idea about this. Audience challenge number three, lucky last. I want you to, uh, so relate, remember, relationships are two ideas and institutions. So for the relational accountability for the rebuilding task, I want you to go back to an idea that you use a lot, that you are accountable to. But are you being relationally accountable to it? Are you being respectful? Are you honouring that idea? Could be any idea. Could be something I could see some sort of little frowns and brows. I love, I love having an actual audience to look at. I can see frowns and brows. Um, so I don't know, maybe you're a Marxist and you really like dialectic, whatever it is. I've forgotten what it is. It was a long time ago, first year Marxism. <laughs> um, and maybe you use it quite a lot in your work, but you've never really shown it the respect it deserves. That kind of thing is what I'm talking about. Anyway, my response to some of these many legacies, some of the many legacies of epistemological colonial violence is to, be, is to support and be counted amongst those who seek to retrace, regather, and rebuild indigenous sciences in a way that honour these systems, that incorporates indigenous ontology and axiology, that legitimately centres country and are genuinely relational or relationally accountability. My response is to offer the academy a million little, a million little opportunities daily to be decolonised. who many of you might have met before. Um, I'll quickly introduce myself because there's some unfamiliar faces um, in the group here. I'm Ruth Morgan. I'm the director of the Centre for Environmental History here at the ANU. And I'd also like to, to thank Uncle Paul and uh, for his very generous welcome to country. And I'd like to acknowledge and celebrate the traditional owners of these unceded lands of the Ngunnawal and Navarri peoples and pay my respects to their elders past and present. So, for those of you who haven't met Pete before, I had the pleasure of um, uh, being involved in a session that uh, Pete ran uh, last year, but Pete is a Gamilaray man from Mackay, Queensland, graduated from the ANU in 2019 with a Bachelor of Science, majoring in physics, specialising in astronomy and astrophysics. And his really important work highlights the significance, the scientific significance of indigenous star knowledges and what we need to do in order to preserve these knowledges on country as well as in the night sky. I love that we've brought down the light because it brings that little nocturnal vibe to the, to the event. And I'm going to hand over to Pete now to take us through his important work. Thank you. Do I have a way of clicking through slides? Ooh, yes. It's only going to show the way. Questions for, for both the um, Thank you, Ruth, uh, for the wonderful introduction. Um, and also, thank you, Kate, for that wonderful presentation. That was very powerful, and, and I loved every minute of it. Uh, so, before I begin, I just want to give a quick acknowledgement of country. Standing here today on the lands of the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples, I acknowledge their elders, I acknowledge their ancestors, and I acknowledge the people of this land. And to answer your question, Kate uh, Winamella, that I just used in that as acknowledge, uh, also means to learn, to know, to love, to understand uh, in Gamilaroi language. Um, so for those of you that 
They wanted to know that in Gamilaroi, uh, the word would be Winamilla. Um, yeah, so I'm here today to talk a little bit about the work that I do here. Um, yeah, so I'm an ANU graduate, currently enrolled in a Master of Philosophy uh, here at ANU, up at the Research School of Astronomy and Astrophysics. Um, and I haven't got a lot of time today, uh, not as much time as I would love to talk about all this stuff. Um, um, so I'll just jump straight into it. So this is on the left, a list of all the objects that I would love to talk to you about today, but I don't have the time for it, and that's not even a comprehensive list over there. But those are some of the objects that you can see with your own eyes, some of them if you're lucky enough in the case of the last two. Just standing here, go ahead, in your backyard, maybe, we'll talk about that as well. And on the right, um, we know that a lot of the times these knowledges are used in a very practical sense. Um, so like Kate was talking about, it's all about relating things so we can actually relate what we see in the sky to our country down here on Earth. And we can use those in various ways, many of which are essential to, to not only continuing our culture, but continuing our survival in all aspects of our everyday life. So now the one story that I did want to tell today uh, is one of my favorite stories, uh, and it uses uh, the Milky Way here. So this picture on the right hand side is a, is a picture of uh, looking into the center of our galaxy. Um, so if you follow any astronomy news, you might have seen recently a, an image of a black hole um, where radio astronomers actually took a telescope the size of the Earth and they actually imaged the black hole that's actually at the center of this picture. Um, and so this is a really important um, constellation within uh, Gamilaroi astronomy in particular, the story that I'm going to tell today. And it makes a real important distinction between the Western idea of a constellation um, and this idea within uh, indigenous astronomy, and that's this idea of dark constellations. So instead of like Orion or, or the Southern Cross where you're sort of connecting the dots between the stars to make those images, here we're actually going to use those dark uh, spaces between the stars in those gas lanes of the Milky Way um, and all of those really uh, important aspects of the Milky Way to actually make our, our pictures in this case. And again, it's an idea of reflecting what we see in the sky and relating that to what we see here on Earth so that we can use what we see in the sky to tell us what's happening here on Earth. And so this is the story of the water day, uh, the celestial emu, or the celestial dinawa. Um, and this is an important constellation because this is a calendar. Um, so this is what we can use to tell sort of things like the seasons, animal behaviors, um, where important resources like food and water are available. Uh, so all of those sort of important things. There are also ceremonial links to this uh, object as well, which I haven't included in this because there is some cultural restrictions on that sort of knowledge, but this is one of, if not the most important um, of our sort of uh, celestial objects that we look at throughout the year. And so this story starts uh, around April or May. Um, so we've just sort of come through this time of year now. And that's when you see that full Milky Way, like we've seen in that first photo stretched out across the sky. And so this we call the, the first appearance of the emu. And as we can see on the right hand side, it looks like an emu in full sprint. So what this says to us is that's the female emu chasing the male emu. So that's how we knew that it was breeding season. So we could go out and we could hunt the emu eggs as a source of food. And then as the year goes on and the, the sky, it, it rotates um, as we move around the sun throughout the year, we can now see that the emu's position has changed and instead of its head sort of pointing up, now it's got its head pointed down towards the earth. And we can no longer see the legs of the emu. So we're coming into this period now, so this is July or August sort of time. Um, and that's how we knew that the male emu was now sitting on the nest and so that the emu eggs were beginning to hatch. So we knew that at some point we would have to stop hunting those emu eggs so that the emu population didn't die out and that we had a sustainable food source year in and year out. And then again, very late in the year now, um, so towards November and that sort of time, the emu gets very low in the sky you can sort of just see the Milky Way just above the horizon. And so what this signified was the emu with its head in the watering hole. So that's how we knew that we just had the spring rains, that the watering holes were full, and we could go out and we could um, 
collect the water, but we also knew that the dry season was going to be incoming soon and that we would have to make preparations for that. And then eventually, as you come into the new year, the emu is below the horizon. Uh, we can no longer see the emu at all. The emus had left the watering hole, so the watering holes were empty. And we had to then wait again for April, May to come around, where the emu comes back and that cycle repeats itself. <coughs> and so as we can see from this story here, there's a lot of aspects around animal behaviours, around food, water, all of these sort of aspects um, and ceremonial aspects to this that are important. Uh, our culture and, and, our, and our living. And now I have an image here. Uh, so this is from um, Mount Stromlo Observatory. Um, and so this is a, like a panoramic view. So if you can imagine the center of the screen is looking directly south. And so then right over on the, the right hand side of the screen, we've got directly west. And on the left hand side of the screen, you've got directly east. So we've got a lot of really important objects that are, with, that are contained within this picture. So we can sort of see the Milky Way appearing there on the left-hand side, stretched across the sky. Um, over here, you might notice Orion. So you can see Orion's belt there and Betelgeuse. Betelgeuse is a really important um, story that I really love to tell that I just don't have time to do. But the variability of Betelgeuse, so it's a bright red star that varies its brightness over quite short periods of time. And those observations were actually recorded within the traditional knowledges of the Kakatha people from South Australia. Um, and it's related to the Hyades cluster down here. So we've got um, Aldebaran, another one of these bright red variable stars that's contained in this story as well. Uh, over on the left-hand side, you'll notice the Southern Cross and the Pointer Stars. Uh, there's a really uh, important story about that in Vanilla culture, which actually relates to the death of the first man on Earth which actually has a lot of important cultural information contained within it. Um, some of you that are, I guess, a little bit more astronomically minded, you might even notice that we've got the Large Magellanic Cloud and the Small Magellanic Cloud in here. So these are two dwarf galaxies that orbit around the Milky Way. Um, and so those objects are actually known within Gamilaroi culture as well and their connection to the afterlife, uh, similar to the Southern Cross story. So a lot of information that's contained within this photo here. Um, and I want to ask, what is this down here in the left-hand corner? Anyone mm -hmm. ever guess? No, so this photo was taken about 2 a.m., uh, about four years ago. Oh. That's, that's, that's Tugranon. Oh, that's Tugranon. So a lot of my research is on um, protecting our traditional knowledges from something called light pollution. Um, so now I got this idea um, when, when Carolyn reached out to me and, and told me the topic of, of this sort of area on violence and stuff like that. My supervisor, uh, Professor Duane Hamaker at University of Melbourne has actually written a paper on this, which he titled, uh, Whitening the Sky, Light Pollution as a Form of Cultural Genocide. That's because our connection to the sky, our connection to these objects, is essential to our connection to our own culture. To be able to see those seasonal markers and those indicators that inform us not only about uh, plants, animals, seasons, food, water, but also ceremonial ties. Everything that that ties into us and how that connection is essential and why it's being lost to something like light pollution. So you can actually see the Earth from space at night because of light pollution. So this was taken by a NASA uh, satellite. So it's basically a, a composition of images over about three weeks in 2012 and 2013. And so you can actually see this is the dark side of the Earth. So you can sort of see the, the sunrise on the left hand side of the screen there. But everything that you can see there is city lights, mining, all sorts of different light pollution. And it's not until you actually see something like this that you actually realise how bright the Earth is in the dark of the night. So what is light pollution? Uh, so light pollution is, as a definition, something that is man-made. It, it, it is made by humans. Um, so, oh yeah, cool. um, so the idea that, um, like the moon, for instance, can actually block a lot of our views to objects and stuff like that. 
but light pollution is exclusively human contributions to that um, sky glow that we see. So sky glow is that sky dome like we've seen of Tuggeranong there. Uh, light clutter is an example, like football stadiums are a classic example of that. Light trespass happens a lot in mining, so gas flares and those sort of ideas. Um, and so the causes are generally down to poor policy around uh, development of our cities. Um, and so that's one of the ways in which I want to, to approach this is actually the way in which we look at the way we use light, for instance. So switching to something like a red wavelength light as opposed to a blue wavelength light uh, reduces that light pollution quite a lot. It also has additional health benefits in that blue wavelength light uh, is shown to disrupt sleep patterns. So you might notice your phone has a red light mode, which you can turn on at night and doing so might actually help you get better sleep. Um, shielding our lighting, so the idea that we focus lighting so that it's only focused on the area that we want. So street lights, for example, are shielded so that it only provides light to the street and doesn't spread out into people's houses and, and everywhere else. Only using lights where they're needed, so through the idea of motion sensors or, or timers that make sure that the light's on when it needs to be on and off when it needs to be off. And a big part of what I do is education because a lot of people just don't realise that this is a thing. And so the most extreme case of that is to, through the implementation of a dark sky area. So Siding Spring Observatory, where we do our research here at ANU at the research school, is a dark sky park. Um, but fracking from the mines near Bogabri, which is about 120 kilometers away from Siding Spring, has a bigger impact than the larger neighboring towns of Narrabri and Dunada. So mining is a huge issue. And light pollution is so pervasive that Siding Spring Observatory is impacted by the light pollution from Sydney, which is over 400 kilometres away. So that's how pervasive of a problem this is. And so I decided to have a look at this uh, early, uh, late last year, early this year, on the Milky Way in particular. So I used two methods to analyse this. Firstly, using empirical observations of the Milky Way. So I found a report um, from a uh, observer that was at the Paris Observatory in 1907, and he recorded what objects he could see at what point the sun got below the horizon. And he said that he could see the Milky Way from the Paris Observatory when the sun was 13 degrees below the horizon. And in 2014, Krumi estimated that that was, I don't expect you to understand the units, but 20.2 and 20.3 is the important number there. And in 2016, Felthy et al. used a, basically a software version to estimate the sky brightness all around the Earth. Uh, and they came up as an estimated sky brightness of 20 to 20.6, which is in agreement with the empirical observations of the same object. And they also showed that only 2 to 5% of Australia's population lived in an area where they can see the Milky Way from their own backyard. Despite the fact that over 80% of this country can clearly see the Milky Way. Most of our population is in built-up areas with poor light management pollution with Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane, these built-up areas like that. And so um, that's essentially what I wanted to talk about today and this idea that light pollution is a problem not only um, scientifically for our research but also culturally, environmentally and for medical and health benefits as well. So it's, it's not a problem that's exclusive to one area. Um, but it is a problem that we need to face, so thank you.